Good evening. This is Joe Gallo of ANCAN, and I'd like to welcome you to Invasion of the Prostate Snatchers 13 Years Later, an evening with Dr. Mark Schultz. I've got a couple of quick items I want to hit as we get started here, and then we can uh, get into the presentation. Uh, the standard disclaimers are that anything you hear or that's presented tonight either by any of the participants, including the doctor, is not to be considered as medical advice. And if you find something that is well worth interest, we suggest that you take that forward to your medical team. And with that, I'm going to uh, pass it over to, to Peter Kapka, who yeah. is a patient and former board member of ANCAN. Greetings. Yes, I'm Peter Kafka. I'm speaking to you from cloudy Maui, Hawaii, which has been my home for the past 35 years. And it's paradise unless you get sick. Uh, yes, I am a patient. And, uh, and fortunately, I'm a longtime patient of Dr. Schultz. So I fell into this slot of being able to open this uh, webinar, which I'm very grateful for. So I've been a moderator for our, our ANCAN organization for since almost since it, from the inception, essentially, in 2016. Um, ANCAN was founded as a 501c3 in 2016. It grew out of about 15, past 15 years of other support groups and associations that uh, many of our members have been involved with. It's a uh, peer, patient-led organization. It was started with prostate, and that's still kind of the bread and butter of our organization, although we've expanded beyond prostate cancer uh, and, then, and expanded to other conditions beyond cancer. And that's why we use the words and can rather than answer a cancer foundation. Uh, but presently we have some 15 or 16 monthly dedicated prostate cancer support groups, including weekly groups for active surveillance, weekly groups for advanced recurrent disease, um, bi-monthly, twice a month groups for intermediate uh, prostate cancer. We run a group monthly for guys under 60 who have particular ins issues that not, doesn't relate to everybody else. Uh, we have a group uh, where we called Men Speaking Freely, where we discuss things not so much around treatment, but around emotional issues from a perspective of guys dealing with, with cancer. And so there's something there for everyone. We've divided all our groups up so that we don't um, we don't confuse each other. We don't address things um, that don't need to be addressed in the advanced group. Uh, and we can drill down for concerns that people have in their specific diagnosis. So with that said, um, I go back to 2014 when I was diagnosed, just about nine years ago. And yes, it was a bummer, like it is for most of us. I was the proverbial moose caught in the headlines, headlights, as most of us probably can identify with, uh, much bigger than a deer. And uh, of course, I had a large ego. And of course, I was healthy as a moose and never got sick a day in my life. And Rarely went to doctors and rarely paid attention to things, but lo and behold, uh, this disease hit me. But I hit the trifecta. Um, a friend of my girlfriend's uh, called her on her birthday when I was diagnosed and told her about a guy that helped him with prostate cancer. I called that guy up in Michigan who was working out of his kitchen, I think, all day. And he told me, I told him what was going on with me. He said, well, you got to call these guys in California. So the next day I called up uh, prostate oncology specialists, uh, which is Dr. Mark Schultz and his colleagues 
uh, at that time it was Jeffrey Turner, Dr. Jeffrey Turner and Dr. Lamb. I called up and the um, receptionist, I think her name is Linda, uh, was very nice and said, uh, can you come in Friday? And this is a Wednesday. And I said, whoa, wait a minute, I live in Hawaii. So we made an appointment for Monday. I jumped on a plane, flew over overnight, got on the bus for a dollar, the big blue bus, stops 20 minutes later right across the street from their office. And I ended up spending two and a half hours in that office uh, right off the bat. Walked out of there thinking, when have I ever spent two and a half hours in a doctor's office before? Started treatment that very day um, and became engaged. And then I find out that not only does he have a thriving practice specializing just in prostate cancer, but he had a nonprofit organization that ran um, large seminars for men to educate men and their partners on all aspects of prostate cancer. So I flew home, turned around a few weeks later and flew back for a, this conference. And lo and behold, I run into 800 men dealing with all parts of prostate cancer, educating themselves, learning to be their own advocate. So I was hooked. I've been back to that conference every year since. And I keep thinking, why don't doctors in every condition, every medical condition, be passionate enough to want to educate their patients, to be at, to be their own advocates and learn about what they're going through so that they can help themselves and help others. So with th those words, I want to introduce um, Howard. Howard is, um, is a remarkable fellow that um, we ran into through ANCAN a number of years ago. One second, let me get my. Howard, for almost 30 years, was the medical editor for the Chicago, Chicago Sun Times. Um, he's active in active surveillance. He's a moderator in our active surveillance group. He's been with that for quite a while. He's um, one of the co founders of ASPE the active surveillance uh, prostate group. So with that introduction, I'd like to introduce Howard Walensky, my dear friend. Well, thanks, Peter. I wish I was where you are, even if it's gray, it's around zero here in Chicago. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I connect also with Dr. Schultz, but more indirectly. Uh, from June through September 2010, I was in the gray zone. I had a rising PSA just under four and an inconclusive biopsy. It was a period of uncertainty and anxiety. But in August of that year, I heard from a cousin of mine about a new book, The Invasion of the Prostate Snatchers by Dr. Mark Schultz and his patient, uh, Ralph Blum. The title made me laugh, it was a grabber, but the message of the book served me well as the authors shared their mission. They offered patients like me, quote, a roadmap for safe passage through the treacherous medical terrain. Fortified by Dr. Schultz's book, I dug in when I was finally diagnosed with a tiny one millimeter so-called cancer in a single core. The urologist tried to rush me into the OR. I can cure it next Tuesday, he said. But I had already done my homework and got a second opinion at this University of Chicago. I repelled the invasion of a prostate snatcher. I went on active surveillance and never looked back. Um, and this year, I'll observe my pras mitzvah, 13 years on uh, active surveillance. So I'm thrilled that we have Dr. Schultz here as our speaker tonight. I'm going to give you some background on him. Dr. Schultz is double board certified medical oncologist. He serves as executive director of the Prostate Cancer Research Institute and medical director of prostate oncology specialists in Marina del Rey, California. 
as Peter mentioned, his practice is devoted to prostate cancer, which is quite unusual. He received his medical degree from Creighton University in Omaha. He completed his internal medicine internship in uh, medical oncology. I'm sorry, at the University of Southern California Medical Center. And he, as Peter mentioned, is co-founder of PCRI, which holds really great programs. And I hope uh, Dr. Schultz will give us the details on how his organization in March is holding live programs again uh, for the first time since COVID started. Now, he is the straight man to Dr. Mark Moyad uh, at these uh, popular meetings. So, but, but you know, he's gonna be flying solo today. So, um, okay, so my big question to Dr. Schultz is 13 years have passed for both of us. What has changed? Are you still repelling the invasion of the prostate snatchers? So Dr. Schultz, take it away. I really, really re admire what the work you're doing. And I'm, um, as I say, very honored to have a chance to share some thoughts, which uh, will be focused more toward, uh, a little bit towards early stage. I know we'll be doing Q&A for all stages of prostate cancer, but when we talk about invasion of the prostate snatchers, uh, the book originally, which came out in 2010, uh, was designed to uh, raise awareness about overtreatment of early stage prostate cancer. So we'll go through what we've learned since that book was published, and uh, we have a second edition. Um, the um, uh, that came out about uh, maybe a year, almost a year and a half ago, and uh, updated a lot of the things. Many things have changed in the last 13 years. And uh, we'll go through and share some of those today. Uh, but, the, um, but the underlying message has not changed. The underlying message is that what people initially think they know about cancer, uh, when they're informed of, a, of any cancer diagnosis, particularly a prostate cancer diagnosis, is often grossly inaccurate based on how much has changed in the last 10, 15 years. And uh, the amount of knowledge we have has exploded, and uh, and you want to be well informed about the latest things in medicine because much of it is very very good news. So we're going to go through and uh, cover some of the issues. But uh, Ralph Blum was already mentioned, my co-author, and uh, Ralph was a trailblazer in uh, the whole process of patient advocacy and uh, taking responsibility for your own health. Ralph was a, a Fulbright scholar, Harvard graduate, a truly brilliant but very down-to-earth guy. And and the uh, Invasion of the Prostate Snatchers book, he wrote every every other chapter detailing his experiences fighting off the prostate snatchers and deciding not to do surgery. So I didn't have a lot of time to prepare for this, so I just detailed some of the clinical cases in this particular uh, situation, Ralph Blum's case. And uh, I'm just gonna go through it quickly to try and get the idea of, of uh, capture several decades on a single page. And so let's just go through this real quick. So Ralph uh, was originally uh, thought uh, to have prostate cancer in 1990. Uh, at that time, he must have been, let's see, um, he must have been about 50, in his mid 50s. And uh, the, um, the doctor did a biopsy on him, apparently missed the spot and wanted to rebiopsy it. And Ralph was so traumatized by the biopsy that he said, no way, Jose, and uh, moved to Hawaii. He was also in Maui and, uh, and basically designed his own surveillance program. Uh, as you'll see as we get into this talk, active surveillance was a codified reality in the medical world in the United States starting around 2007. So this is 17 years before the doctors got around to thinking that you could do active surveillance. Ralph put himself on active surveillance and he was following a program very similar to what we use today where he would get a uh, PSA uh, uh, every three or four months and have the doctor do a digital rectal exam once a year. And he would fly over to University of California, San Francisco for MRI sc uh, scans. So in about 10 years of doing this, uh, nine years, I guess, in June of 99, his PSA had gone up to eight, and he finally uh, capitulated and had a second biopsy, which confirmed 
Gleason 3 plus 3, which we now know today is a genre of prostate cancer that never spreads and uh, should be watched. Uh, that was not uh, known in 1999, however. So um, the physicians were all, the urologists were all telling him to have surgery. And uh, uh, again, Ralph dug in his heels and wasn't convinced that he needed an operation. Ralph was uh, uh, somewhat of a ne'er-do-well. Uh, he, he made a living as a uh, professional author. He wrote several novels and uh, had more than one girlfriend and was terrified at the prospect of, uh, of losing his ability to get erections, which is, a, I won't say a foregone conclusion back in that era uh, for surgery, but it was a high likelihood. So with further monitoring, the PSA went up, in, uh, and in June of 2002, the PSA was 13, and he was getting regular color Doppler ultrasound uh, uh, imaging of his prostate, and the spot was growing. And finally, when the PSA rose to 18, that was when Ralph first consulted me in Marina del Rey. He flew over from Hawaii, and uh, he uh, was willing, not unwilling to have surgery, but he decided to treat himself with hormone therapy. Uh, back then, it was just Lupron, and he took that for a year. And uh, his PSA went down to undetectable levels. And that's when he approached me about writing a book. Uh, when After he had such a great uh, response, I think it had been about, uh, gosh, seven years, no, five years later, about 2007, he approached me. He had to teach me how to write as I was a uh, literary ignoramus. But he was very patient. And we worked on the book for about three years. And it was published, I believe, around 2010. But going on with Ralph's story, he um, uh, uh, responded well to the hormone treatments. PSA went down to zero. Um, and uh, a follow-up biopsy in 2005 showed a little bit of residual 3 plus 3. And then in 2007, uh, he had some 3 plus 4. Again, something that we would be comfortable watching here in this modern era. Uh, he went, flew over to um, the Netherlands for a a special scan called Combidex to look and see if there's any spread into his lymph nodes. Uh, that was clear, and it gave him the uh, the courage to continue watching. Um, uh, and another color Doppler in 2011 showed uh, some progression in the left apex, and his PSA had risen back to 14. This is, uh, again, about 10 years after he took the Lupron for uh, just one year. So he decided at that point uh, to go undergo radiation, and uh, uh, with intensity modulated therapy, uh, and that uh, was effective, brought his PSA down to two. To two. Um, Ralph uh, then, uh, d thinking many ways that his prostate cancer was behind him, he was seeing some other physicians, and I found out indirectly that he'd undergone an operation for diverticulitis, which is an inflammation of the rectal wall, and apparently did not do well postoperatively. His PSA was up around 18 at that time. I don't know the details of uh, what the status of his prostate, but at that time, Ralph was 84, and we're talking, again, almost uh, 30 years uh, or so after his initial diagnosis. So uh, Ralph's story, I think, illustrates well two things. One is that what we think of as prostate cancer can be a very low-grade process, and that's why we're, we're meeting, and that's why we talk about active surveillance. And the other is the value of taking personal responsibility for your own health care. So uh, that is a feasible thing. Some people are so intimidated by that prospect, but uh, with research and consultation and study, uh, people can get up to speed in terms of what's what the best way is to manage their situation. So I'm going to, in the first third of this talk, go through and just talk a little bit about perspective on prostate cancer because it's quite a bit different from other cancers. Uh, then we'll go and uh, talk a little bit about the latest and uh, some of the things we're learning in active surveillance and the active surveillance realm. And then if we have time at the end, we'll talk a little bit about some general men's health issues. So first I want to um, try, and this is almost impossible to do, but I want to try because it's so important to help people understand that the word cancer doesn't really say much because you can have skin cancers that are harmless, and you can have, have uh, you know, leukemias that are very, very dangerous, and everything in between. So if someone says they have cancer, uh, we have to dig down deeper and find out what does it really mean. And uh, it's such a frightening word, though, many times people don't get past that. So uh, colon and prostate cancer are um, both uh, 
serious uh, diagnoses in many men. Uh, as you can see from the information in front of you, that colon cancer and prostate cancer are killing about the same number of uh, people every year. Uh, but if you look at the annual number of cases that are, <coughs> excuse me, diagnosed, you can see that there's uh, the ratio of people dying to diagnosis is about eight to one for prostate cancer, or one eighth of people diagnosed are at risk for dying of it, whereas a third of people with colon cancer. But even more importantly, in the far right column, the the time for someone to have their day of reckoning, where the, the actual mortality occurs, um, can be on average about 13 months after a failure for colon surgery, but average is about 13 years after a failure for prostate surgery. So we're talking about a condition that has can can slowly over a period of many years be deadly, but the uh, the long timeline of prostate cancer is so distinct from other cancers that it makes it hard for people to wrap their heads around it and uh, and adapt to these realities, especially since this is a condition occurring in elderly men to start with. So uh, so this is just a, a first thought, but um, I think we should just say, well, how can it behave so differently from other cancers? Uh, and colon cancer, I'm just using as an illustration. You could put lung cancer, pancreas cancer, bone cancer, brain cancer. Why are these other cancers so much more deadly than prostate cancer is? Well, there's a number of reasons. They grow far more quickly. They metastasize, and that word metastasize is really the crux of what makes cancer dangerous. They metastasize much more easily than prostate cancer does. And when they spread, they spread to cr uh, critical organs such as the liver, lung, and brain, which you really can't afford malfunction of, whereas with prostate, lymph nodes and bones are very tolerant and uh, can endure actually quite a few metastases without malfunctioning. With all these other cancers, uh, pancreas cancer, bones cancers, uh, lung cancers, there's no such thing as hormone therapy. With prostate cancer, the median response time of relapsed prostate cancer after surgery or radiation with modern, up-to-date, first-generation, uh, second-generation hormone therapy is 18 years. Yes, I said that correctly. Median response, average response time to keep the PSA in check. I'm not talking about living 18 years. I'm talking about being in remission is 18 years. Um, how can this be? Well, one reason is hormone therapy is effective, but the other reason is that we catch prostate cancer recurrence as much earlier because of PSA. And when things aren't going well, we know that the PSA misbehaves, so we can address uh, and uh, the situation and change the protocol. And then now, as of uh, 2022 and 2023, we have an amazing new scan uh, called PSMA PET, which we'll go into a little bit more further. So. Bottom line then is I don't want you to rely on the assumptions. You need to start delving for your own facts and learn the underlying principles as they relate to prostate cancer, not to cancer in general. So you have to take responsibility and, and look at the actual numbers. What are the cure rates with each treatment? What's the likelihood of, um, of a side effects with each treatment? because people are going to live a long time if their treatments have a lot of side effects. They're going to have to endure those side effects for the rest of their lives. And one thing that's hard to, for us, time is hard to wrap our minds around, the fact that the disease can play out over decades, but also our own mortality. Many of us are in our 60s and 70s, and uh, that, uh, that reality also protects us against a prostate cancer disaster. If it's going to take 20 or 25 years for the prostate cancer to create difficulties or mortality, if we're already 75 or so, which we can see here that the average survival of a 75-year-old is about 10 years. So let's say you're a very healthy 75-year-old and you live 20 years to 95. Uh, we're not uh, going to be totally unrealistic, are we, and expect to live to be 105. I've got hundreds and hundreds of patients, but I've only had a couple males. Women, uh, have, of course, have better survival, but I've only had a couple males that have made it past 100. So uh, let's learn how to think realistically about our status and not punish ourselves with uh, serious uh, side effects that aren't really going to make us live longer. And then uh, last point in terms of uh, understanding the medical world, there's all different levels of, of medical doctors. And uh, 
none of them are out there saying, I, I don't know what I'm doing. They're all saying, I know what I'm doing, follow me. And some of them are doing it with relatively little experience. So you have to be careful in that department. And I think support groups are a wonderful way to, uh, to learn about the good doctors in your community. Now, this came from the Investors Business Daily about 10 years ago, but I think it illustrates the, the, uh, the, how rapidly technology is changing and how difficult it is for the medical doctors to stay up to date with the, uh, all the new uh, wonderful breakthroughs. I only do prostate cancer and I have a hard time keeping up with prostate cancer. The average medical oncologist is taking care of over 100 different types of cancer and they're all changing quickly. And when you look at this uh, insane technologically uh, um, uh, uh, world that we're, that's growing so quickly, it's reflected in how much li just life expectancy has changed. It, this is, uh, was it Thomas Hobbes said, they're quoting him here in this little newspaper clipping, poor, nasty, brutish, and short was how the philosopher Thomas Hobbes described life in the 17th century. And it wasn't much better at the dawn of the 20th. To live to 50 was to count one's blessings, and one in 10 children died before their first birthday. Uh, this is mostly from infectious diseases and, viol and violence, and uh, this has radically changed due to improved drugs, vaccines, and breakthroughs. So you look up to about 1900, the average uh, life expectancy was about age 30. When I was training at USC back in the um, late 1980s, and we lost a patient from a cancer at, in their early 70s. The team that was caring for him uh, got around and we, we mourned their loss, but we also sort of patted ourselves on the back so we got him to age 70. He lived a full life and things have changed just in my lifetime. Now when we lose someone at age 70, we wonder what did we do wrong? What did we miss? So things are changing very quickly and the medical world is having a lot of trouble keeping up with all this, uh, new, these new developments. So this is one of the challenges, is finding experts that are really on the cutting edge. Now, of course, everyone thinks it devolves to simply, well, what kind of cancer is it? And that is extremely important. These are the th five things that we look at to try and determine for a prostate cancer patient how it's likely to behave in the future, and more importantly, what's the chances of it spreading outside the prostate. That's really what differentiates a harmless prostate cancer from a dangerous one is metastasis, the, the, the spread outside the gland. So um, the stage of the, the tumor itself has uh, rocketed to the number one position now that we have PSMA PET scans. In the past, we had to use Gleason score, that's the grade, and stage to try and guess about the possibility of micrometastatic disease because bone scans and CAT scans needed a chunk of cancer that big before they would show up on a scan. Now, with PSMA PET scans, two millimeter lesions will light up brightly on a scan. So instead of guessing about whether the cancer has spread, we actually can do a scan and find out if it has spread. So tumor stage, as judged by a PSMA PET scan, in my opinion, has now become the new most important metric, whereas in the past, it was always grade of cancer. The Gleason score was the best way to predict the likelihood that cancer was outside the prostate because whether it's outside the prostate or not is ultimately the most important determinant. So you could say, well, the, um, the stage, sorry for flipping the slides around, the stage uh, is only telling us right now, it doesn't tell if it's, if it's uh, going to spread tomorrow or a week from now or a year from now. No, it, that is true. But it is telling us, since we know that these tumors that are being diagnosed in the prostate have been there for several years before they come to medical attention, that at least as of the present, that particular genre of tumor in that particular patient has not demonstrated spread. And that is a very reassuring and comforting fact. Now, um, that doesn't mean that these other factors have lost all power to predict the future. Uh, so the second most important thing is still the grade or the Gleason score, and there's genetic testing such as Oncotype, Prolaris, and the like. Um, the third most important uh, factor, and these are in a hierarchy of uh, relevance, is the size of the tumor. Um, that has to do with uh, how big it is on a scan, say an MRI or an ultrasound. Percentage of cores positive on a, on a random biopsy. I'm not a fan of random biopsies, but they're still happening. And the PSA. High PSAs have argued for larger amounts of cancer 
lower PSAs for smaller cancers. Then uh, beyond that, again, all these five factors are a way to try and distinguish what type of prostate cancer we're dealing with. How the disease responds, it responds in reaction to a treatment. If you give radiation, does it stay cured or does it come back? And then how long does it take to come back? Does it come back in six months or six years? Tells you a lot about what the enemy is up to. Uh, slower growing cancers or ones that stay in remission after treatment are obviously far less dangerous than the ones that come back quickly. So this is how we distinguish between the different cancer types. And I know I'm speaking in general terms, not in terms of specific action points, but this is the type of way that people need to prioritize. One of the biggest problems that I see in the prostate cancer world, not only for patients, but also for doctors, is an absence of perspective, a lack of experience about how diverse prostate cancer is. And it's to understand what to do and where a person stands, there has to be an understanding of, of how this particular disease fits in the spectrum of all the other prostate cancers. We know a lot about prostate cancer, but we don't necessarily know how to identify where a specific patient fits in that spectrum. Clearly, if the disease is more aggressive, we want to use more uh, aggressive treatment. And if the disease is less aggressive, we want to use milder treatment. Obvious, but sometimes uh, lost in the, in the shuffle of uh, the complexities and all the fears that people are enduring with this. So I'm going to, the slide after this, we're going to talk about increasing treatment intensity. But before we get to that, I want to talk about factors that help people decide what to do that are outside of the treatment intensity. Certainly, as you ramp up the treatment intensity, we give stronger medicines and combinations of medicines. We're going to be able to eradicate more cancer, but no doubt that will also create more side effects. And if we're treating a harmless cancer, we're creating side effects without any value. But um, there are other really important factors besides treatment intensity in trying to sort out what the right thing to do is. One, of course, we've covered just briefly already is the age of the patient. If you're 85 years old and, and you're uh, realistic and satisfied to just living in, to 95, which is a, a realistic endpoint, practically nothing you could do could ever allow you to die of prostate cancer because it's slow growing and the treatments are so, so effective. A uh, person's fitness level is very important, just as their age is important. Um, then we get to quality of life considerations. What, um, what, what sort of fanaticism are you bringing to the table in terms of the desire to be cured of cancer? Uh, and we can accommodate that fan fanaticism, but it will come at a higher price in terms of more intense treatment. And then what, uh, how do you prioritize maintaining uh, a, a capacity for normal and spontaneous erections? This is uh, in the modern era of effective local therapies with seed implants and radiation and the like. Uh, damage to the uh, bladder or the rectum has been practically eliminated in skillful centers. But what we are left with is a, uh, still a significant risk of erectile dysfunction. Now, with injections or implants, men can, can get erections, but these are rather draconian methods um, in the prostate world, if you can get erections with Viagra or Cialis, it's not even called erectile dysfunction. But the risk of erectile dysfunction is the last uh, bastion of severe toxicity that comes from, from local therapy to the prostate with radiation or surgery or whatever. So um, the uh, priority to maintain sexual function is varies from patient to patient. Some uh, are very passionate about uh, maintaining erections, others are, are less concerned, and we physicians want to tailor the intensity of treatment based on a patient's priorities. And then now, with the advent of PSMA PET scans, uh, we are starting to consider cutting back on hormone therapy, uh, testosterone uh, blockade, androgen deprivation, whatever you want to call it, because these hormone treatments are designed to uh, provide insurance against the possibility of micrometastatic disease. But now with PSMA PET scans, are we in, a, in an era where we can forego the hormone therapy when we don't find any metastatic disease? Uh, there are no studies yet to address these questions, but it's very logical to consider pulling back on hormone treatment, which can be administered for six months in an intermediate risk patient, 18 months in a high risk patient, 
Uh, certainly effective in people with proven spread, but in people without any uh, metastasis uh, from PSMA, uh, as per PSMA PET scans, uh, can we think about skipping the hormone treatment? Uh, people are not considering also that the monitoring after treatment, if someone has surgery or radiation and uh, can be, and their PSA starts to rise, we can find the cancer at a much earlier stage with PSMA PET scans, and some of these patients will be curable even at relapse. So all the precautions that we've been taking up front with giving 18 months of, of androgen deprivation um, may be overkill now with PSMA PET scans showing no spread. So how much does the patient value retaining his normal testosterone? I won't go into the unpleasant side effects of hormone therapy, but many of us are, are quite aware of those issues. Uh, and then now we do, of course, come down lastly to the cancer stage, grade, and volume. This is going to be uh, help determine the treatment intensity. If someone's high risk, we're going to be more intense than intermediate risk. And then, uh, and last point, of course, is the variation in physician skill, which I've already alert, alluded to. So this slide here is uh, the, just a personal construct. If you look at these two columns, uh, uh, the column of treatments on the on your left is uh, a list of, of monotherapies for treatment of prostate cancer in, in what I would consider ascending intensity, active surveillance being the mildest treatment, of course. Uh, focal therapy may be next, Casadex, which is a very mild hormone treatment at the next level, seed implants, um, and then uh, standard radiation therapy, and then maybe something like Lupron. This is just my sense of, of if I had to go through these things, which one would I feel was the least toxic to the most toxic? That's, this is my professional gestalt. They're, they're hard to compare because they're different types of treatments, but I've dealt with this for a long time. And this is sort of my sense in terms of how toxic these treatments are. But the, the efficacy is uh, uh, progressive as well. Um, on the right column, you're looking at further attempts at more intense treatment with combination therapy. And uh, also, again, in, in escalating uh, intensity as we go down the list, you can see they were adding uh, seed implants to hormones or seed implants to radiation, to hormones plus second generation hormones, even chemotherapy. Um, so the, these um, treatments are very sensible. For example, if you get down to number 13 here on the list, this is the type of thing that you would do for someone with oligometastatic cancer. That means they come in the front door to my office, their PSA is 150, they've got three spots of metastasis on their bones. What are we gonna do for that person? Well, we're gonna give them a treatment to cure their prostate. We're going to radiate their lymph nodes. We're gonna give them combination hormone therapy. We're going to give them three months of taxitera. That's all in line 12. And then, they're under, going to undergo radiation therapy to the spots on the bones. It's quite simple to do. Of course, we would do that. So that's uh, for oligometastatic disease. And then option 14 would be for someone with widespread metastasis. You do all those treatments except for the radiation. Try and get rid of as many spots as possible. And if you can get it down to less than five or so spots, then radiate those last five spots. So, uh, so this is uh, what people are confronted with when they're diagnosed with prostate cancer. There's a lot of options. Uh, and it's so sad that you, uh, newly diagnosed men will come into my office and they'll say, well, Dr. Schultz, I'm just coming to you because I talked to a radiation therapist and he said I should do radiation. I talked to a surgeon, he said I should do surgery. What should I do? Those are my only two choices. Pretty sad. Pretty sad that that's the, that's the way that modern prostate cancer is looked at when we have a spectrum of options for people now. So uh, digging down now into the grade, we talked about how PSMA PET scans are now the, the number one uh, defining issue for whether or not, uh, uh, for helping people design their treatment intensity. Historically, it was the Gleason score. Uh, and the Gleason score was the most powerful indication of whether the cancer would spread and there's a lot of confusion about uh, the grade of prostate cancer because, again, people tend to just sort of bunch all cancer together and they figure it, it can all metastasize. <laughs> Excuse me. Gleason 6 prostate cancer has never been shown to metastasize. It's a harmless, benign tumor that stays inside the prostate. So uh, this is about half of the men that are di of the 200,000 men diagnosed every year. About 100,000 have Gleason 6. So 100,000 men should be considering 
watchful waiting or active surveillance as their primary treatment program. The second most common type of prostate cancer is sort of a transition type of cancer that it has a higher, somewhat higher propensity for spread, but still pretty low likelihood of spread. Some of these men can be watched as well. And you can look at the, uh, the pictures underneath these dogs. Those are histologic sections of what the cancer looks like under the microscope. And it, maybe to the untrained eye, they look, you know, they both have purple and they both have blue dots in them. But the one on the far left, the, the kind that doesn't spread, is those uh, little white spots in the middle there, those are the ducts of what is very similar to what the prostate looks like when you, when you slice it. So Gleason 6 is almost like normal prostate tissue. You start to lose some of that architecture in the Gleason 7, but it still retains some of its desire to act like a prostate gland. But when you get into the Gleason 8s through 10s, you see we lose most of that architecture. I'm talking about the image on the bottom of the far right, and it's mostly just cells. And this uh, is something that wants to behave more like a cancer than like a prostate gland. So, and the statistical possibility of spread goes up. Now, interestingly, they're not going to all spread. I'm going to share a case uh, later in the talk of a man who's been watching his Gleason 8 now for 10 years. And uh, so it's not, not a foregone conclusion that it will spread. But because metastasis is such a watershed event, such an important event, uh, even a, a relatively small chance of spread, if you're in that small group, it's a very serious development. <laughs> excuse, excuse me. So, um, so as a precaution, most people will undergo therapy to eradicate this. But I don't want to give the impression it's like still, it's not as bad as pancreas cancers, lung cancers. Um, uh, most men with uh, the Gleason 8 or higher cases will be cured if they're diagnosed through screening. And, uh, and those that aren't cured can be kept alive uh, for, again, over a decade, oftentimes on a routine basis. <laughs> so, I, again, there's so much confusion between Gleason 6, 7, and 8 because it sounds like a continuum. I like to use the example of skin cancer. Um, skin cancer, the doctors that named the skin cancers were um, much more clever because there is a type of uh, skin cancer called squamous cell, which doesn't spread, but it's considered a cancer. And then there's another type of uh, cancer called melanoma, which we all know is very, very dangerous. They didn't name it skin cancer six and skin cancer seven because the people who were naming things were a lot smarter than the people in the prostate world. And so uh, skin cancer six and skin cancer seven um, gives an idea that they're somehow related with each other. And that's just as in prostate cancer, these different subtypes of cancer are not related to each other. They are different entities altogether. So we should treat them as different entities, just as we would treat a skin cancer uh, differently that's squamous origin as opposed to a melanoma. Now, um, look, um, I don't know if you can see it, I have a little scar on my face from a skin cancer. So there are certainly implications, even though this is a benign tumor, uh, in terms of the cosmetic outcome. Uh, these things are near the eye or uh, or, uh, there can be very difficult to remove. And this is one of the problems with the prostate. The prostate is in such a sensitive location, simply cutting it out can make you impotent, incontinent, uh, and uh, have long-term uh, repercussions with rectal function. So the location of it is incredibly inconvenient, just as sometimes with skin cancers, the location, even though it's not going to metastasize, the location makes it quite a big deal. So that's why prostate cancer is still a big deal, even if it's one of these low-grade processes, because if someone wants to just get rid of it, they're going to take a big chance of having some permanent problems with their quality of life, with their urination, with their sexual function. The other thing to comment is you can see that in the serious uh, genre of cancers, we'll equate, although Gleason 8, the one on the far right, the, the more serious type of prostate cancer is nowhere near as serious as a melanoma is. But uh, you can see that if these are caught at an early stage, these melanomas, if they're caught at a superficial stage, their cure rates are incredibly high. So it is prudent to get a skin exam once a year just to catch these things when they're still curable. Once they invade deeper, uh, they become more dangerous and they're really, there is no hormone therapy, there is no PSA. They, um, these are very, very dangerous cancers if they spread. So, um, so the stage becomes certainly very important where, the stage of a Gleason 6 in your prostate, whether it's small or big, doesn't really have that much relevance. But the stage of an 8, uh, which is bigger, does portend a greater risk of spread. 
and uh, just as the case with melanomas that are deeper, portends a greater risk of spread. So I'm going to change, uh, uh, go a little bit of a different direction and go to uh, what I was invited to talk about was uh, the this perspective on uh, prostate cancer that is um, has been uh, uh, you know so front and center with me since writing Pro Invasion of the Prostate Snatchers and now with a second edition out. I um, had my first exposure to cancer when I was about eight years old. My mom was uh, at our house. I remember I don't have very many memories from my youth, but uh, she was crying because one of her friends had passed away from cancer. And I, I don't think I even knew what cancer was. And she wasn't really explaining it to me. She was just repeating to herself, if only they had caught it sooner, if only they had caught it sooner. And uh, that, uh, that reality of, uh, is the, is the um, most important thing on the, on the higher grade cancers is catching it while it's still localized that it hasn't metastasized. Those are curable cancers. So the, um, the idea of uh, where, where cancer has come from when I was eight years old to the present time, I think it is important to try and get a sense of the, um, of the sweep of time. The, if you look at the, um, my, actually my next slide, we'll go through and uh, talk about the 40 year um, development of cancer in our lifetimes, it's gone from a situation where there almost seemed like nothing was known about cancer. You cut it out and that was all you knew, uh, whereas we've had an explosion of new information. Now, here's a list of some of the breakthroughs that we've uh, been blessed with in prostate cancer over the last 40 years. And uh, I don't have time to talk about all of them. I highlighted or bolded out some of the ones I think we'll at least touch upon briefly. Uh, some of them we, we won't have time to talk about, but each of these things on the on the page here were are huge breakthroughs. Orchiectomy, which is surgical removal of the testicles, discovered in 1940. Prostate cancer started melting away miraculously when you took testosterone away. The, he, uh, Dr. Dr. Huggins invented that idea, and he got the Nobel Prize for that. Uh, nerve sparing surgery, the idea of being able to do an operation and at least some men would escape with uh, a capacity to have erections was a huge breakthrough. Um, when uh, people found a substitute for orchiectomy, which is Lupron, a reversible way to block testosterone rather than a permanent way to block testosterone. That was a big breakthrough. Then PSA came along, random biopsies came along the same year. So before that, trying to find out what was inside the prostate before we had random biopsies was, uh, was incredibly difficult. Seed implant radiation, uh, 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 the first effective type of chemotherapy. Um, Beam radiation, IMRT uh, and, and the like. Uh, then in 2007, the discovery of active surveillance as uh, that Gleason 6 can be safely watched. Um, more powerful hormones, immune therapy, better imaging, uh, targeted biopsies, uh, focal treatments where we treat the cancer instead of the whole prostate and now PSMA pest cancer. So we can't cover all these things, but uh, these are each in their own way marvelous breakthroughs that have helped thousands, if not millions of men. And this is putting a lot of this on the timeline of how things have changed over the last 40 years. You see nerve sparing surgery over there, um, be, even before PSA, uh, they were start, They would diagnose prostate cancer with a digital rectal exam and, uh, and they figured out how to do radical prostatectomies. Then Lupron came along. And then PSA, which uh, in about 1987 came along with the random biopsy, so the number of men that were diagnosed annually before PSA was 100,000 men. In the first five years, there was such a backlog of people with prostate cancer that was unknown. Around 1991 or 1992, they were diagnosing five or 600,000 men with prostate cancer every year with PSA and random biopsy. Now, eventually they caught up and the number of men being diagnosed today is only 200,000 because they got the backlog out of the way but they're still diagnosing twice as much men in the modern era as they did prior to PSA. And that's because of the extra 100,000 men with Gleason 6 that uh, weren't, were, they were never diagnosed before because they weren't cancers, they didn't hurt anybody. So, um, so the PSA testing came along uh, around that. I saw my first prostate cancer patient around 1992, then um, we, uh, we go all the way up to about two th uh, 1998, we uh, gave Taxotair to our first patient. Remember, we didn't have many other options. We had Lupron, and the Lupron stopped working. We would give 
taxotere chemotherapy. I was a medical oncologist. We had a huge infusion center, which now is pretty much empty. Um, then uh, we had uh, robotic surgery come out around 2000, which uh, uh, interestingly supplanted the um, most popular way to treat prostate cancer in 2002, not beam radiation. Beam radiation was, dr uh, was dreadful at that time. Not surgery, because robotic surgery hadn't really picked up steam. Radioactive seed implants was the most popular way to treat prostate cancer around 2002. And more men were treated with radioactive seed implants than they were treated with surgery. And this is uh, the radiation therapist that developed a, a partnership with the surgeons. The surgeons would do the biopsy and then refer them. And then the surgeons would help out with the seed implant. And it was a very effective treatment. The surgeons completely lost interest when robotic, when the da Vinci machine came along and they could go back to doing surgery, which was their, their original training. And then, of course, in uh, 2005, I referred my first patient to the Cleveland Clinic for IMRT, and that's when the radiation therapists lost interest in brachytherapy because now they could charge five times as much to beam radiation uh, as they could for a seed implant, and uh, seed implants got left in the dust. So uh, in 2007, we had our first uh, scientific meeting to discuss whether active surveillance was a viable uh, proposition. Uh, in 2010, Zytiga was approved, and we came out, uh, Ralph Blum and I completed our uh, Invasion of the Prostate Snatchers book. Uh, in 2015, uh, for the first time, a randomized prospective trial showed that MRI imaging, this is first generation crappy MRI imaging, was 20% more active, accurate than random biopsy. And then now recently in 2022, we got PSMA PET scans. So these are the watershed events that have occurred over the last 40 years that have uh, evolved in what, to what we consider modern prostate cancer therapy. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about uh, the random biopsy, which is still happening in close to a million men every year in the United States. And I don't, we don't, we haven't been doing random biopsies in our practice, full-time prostate cancer practice uh, for, you know, over 20 years now. About seven or eight years ago, we stopped doing random biopsies. We have not ordered a single random biopsy in eight years. But uh, what is a random biopsy? It's where the, uh, a large bore needle is uh, stuck through the rectum into the prostate a dozen times, fishing around to see if they can find cancer. Um, as we pointed out already, MRI, even first generation crummy MRIs are more accurate, but the urologists get paid to do biopsies and they don't get paid to do MRIs. So they, uh, there's been a very, very slow movement away from random biopsy towards MRI. So, a newer thing with biopsy is what we call perineal biopsies. So it's been well recognized that random biopsies, ramming the needle through the dirty rectal wall, can put people in the hospital with serious infections. That is um, a real problem. And in a large study that was done in the Netherlands in over 4,000 patients, they confirmed that when you ram the random biopsy a dozen, more than 10 times through the rectal wall into the prostate, about 5% of men will develop a serious infection. These are otherwise healthy people. So that's not good. So uh, a lot of people have tried to develop an alternative where they put the needle through the skin of the perineum, which is be the, the skin between your, your anus and your scrotum. And it doesn't go through the dirty rectal area. And in theory, it lowers the risk of infection. And it does. You can see in the far right, transperineal biopsies um, where they do a, again, a random biopsy, but through the perineum rather than the rectal wall, the number of people that develop serious infections is only two and a half percent. So about 50% reduction in uh, infection rate with perineal biopsies. But now we have targeted biopsies. The idea of randomly jabbing needles around the prostate to see what you'll find uh, with this era of accurate MRIs where you can actually target a suspicious spot, so-called targeted biopsies, um, and it allows us to just take two to three or four biopsies and, uh, and not have to stick through the wall so many times and place people at risk for infection. So in the two middle columns here, you can see fusion biopsies. These are targeted biopsies. When you go after the target with less than five cores, the risk of serious infection is only 1%. And if and in MRI in in bore biopsies with less than cores about two percent. So the perineal biopsy concept is uh, 
uh, a very uncomfortable, I mean, the needle has to go a long ways through your skin to hit the prostate. Many people are using general anesthesia, which is, has its own risks. Uh, in my opinion, with this particular study, perineal biopsies are um, somewhat more dangerous than just doing a standard targeted biopsy. We've been doing targeted biopsies in our practice now for five, six years, seven years, and we have not seen a single infectious complication. I don't know how long that that can happen given the statistics being reported here, it would suggest that the risk should be about one in 100. And in our own experience, it's certainly less than that. So um, the random biopsy uh, is uh, super, still incredibly popular and uh, over a million men, as I mentioned, already go through this every year. One of the other problems is not infections, not the discomfort, but the fact that we find more Gleason 6 cancer. And since people hear the word cancer, about a third of men that are diagnosed with Gleason 6 are still talked into unnecessary radical surgery or radiation. And uh, that's about 30, 40,000 men a year that are undergoing treatment for something that does not require treatment. That's a big deal, and that's largely uh, due to the problems with random biopsy, finding little specks of grade 6 around the prostate. So I will repeat this a few times, but high PSA should be uh, treated with an MRI, not a random biopsy. MRIs that show um, higher grade lesions, if they see shadows on an MRI, they'll grade them from one to five. And fours and fives should have a targeted biopsy of the lesion. It's a rather simple idea, patients get it very quickly, but the industry has been very slow to adopt this technology. Now, it all sounds good on paper, but it was very gratifying when just last month, the New England Journal of Medicine, which we consider the most prestigious scientific publication in the world by far, uh, came out in a study that was done uh, in Europe in almost 18,000 volunteers who uh, between the age of 60, 50 and 60 were uh, given annual PSA screening. So if the PSA was over three, they were randomly allocated to a random biopsy or an MRI followed by a targeted biopsy. And this is to try and once and for all establish the safety of this approach. Something that we've been doing now for eight or nine, 10 years uh, is finally being codified in a scientific study. And what they found is that uh, in the men that got uh, the targeted, excuse me, the random biopsy, they mixed the ra random and targeted into one, one thing. They showed that there are twice as many men diagnosed with Gleason 6. No surprise. When you do the random biopsy, you find more Gleason 6. Certainly not a desirable thing, uh, but it is what it is. And that, but more importantly, what was missed in the people that skipped the random biopsy? So out of more than uh, eight or nine thousand men, they found ten men on the random biopsy that were not picked up by the targeted biopsy with what was called clinically significant prostate cancer. This means it was not pure three plus three; it was three plus four. All ten of these three plus fours were small and were felt to be appropriate for management with active surveillance. So they did not find anyone with only random biopsy alone in this huge study that needed to go on to radical therapy. Rather amazing. Targeted biopsies work. So I just thought this image would sum up my points about what I think about random biopsies. And uh, you can just meditate on this a little bit to try and get a sense of my passion about this whole concept. All right, now we're going to move on and talk a little bit about the types of prostate cancer that can be watched. It's a fairly simple prospect. The, um, the idea of, of cancer being cancer and it would be sort of like the idea of, of uh, all, all felines are, are, are the same. Of course, they aren't. Uh, tigers and, and pussycats are uh, going to behave totally differently. And they're both felines, but they're not equally dangerous. So the type of people that we can treat like a pussycat are the ones, men that have biopsies with three plus three or three plus four uh, Gleason scores. And, the, and the, we can also, in men with higher Gleason scores, even eights, nines, and tens, if they're over age 75 and they have a PSMA PET scan with no metastasis, remember metastasis is the only way it can hurt you. The Gleason score doesn't hurt you. It's the spread of the disease that can hurt you. Uh, men over age 75 with a, a PSMA PET scan that shows no spread, I believe, can also monitor their disease. And we'll give you a few examples that, of that in some men that uh, we've been monitoring in uh, over the years. 
So um, I want to share first uh, uh, one patient that came to me in uh, 1998. And uh, this is before even I was a believer in active surveillance. Remember that the conference uh, that uh, created a consensus that we should be doing active surveillance in Gleason 3 plus 3 was in 2007. So this patient was nine years before that. In 1998, his PSA was 5.8, and um, he went on, had a biopsy that showed Gleason 3 plus 3. And uh, no doubt we told him he should have treatment. That was what the prevailing belief was at that time. Uh, he refused. Um, and so this uh, led to our own homegrown form of active surveillance where we would do high resolution color Doppler in the early years, and we'd alternate with MRIs as the MRIs came online later. And you can see over time that this individual who is now 86 years old, uh, 25 years later, so that means he must have come to us when he was 61, I think, if I'm doing my math right. And um, so he uh, has, as of, uh, if you go all the way to the bottom line, he has a PSA of 12 in July of 2022, and his um, uh, last um, MRI in 2021 showed just a pyreds 3 lesion in the right mid gland, which is, we've had our eye on for years. So the shoe never dropped. This is someone in 1998 was told that he would die if he didn't have immediate surgery. 25 years later, with a PSA of 11 at age 86, in perfectly good health, and in my opinion, and no risk at all of ever getting sick or dying of prostate cancer. I think 25 years kind of validates that conclusion. 25 years of monitoring known prostate cancer. The next example I want to share with you is a uh, patient that came to me, I think go back, he also, 1997, Bill Duke is a uh, prominent director and actor, and uh, he had been diagnosed with a, a grade six uh, in uh, 1997 and his PSA was 4.7. And he also um, uh, dug his heels in when I told him, Bill, you know, you got to have treatment. Uh, you know, we had some sense from, uh, uh, from uh, you know, Scandinavia that you, they would do watchful waiting in elderly men, but he was a, uh, relatively young at that time. I think uh, he was in his uh, 50s as well. And so he, um, he said, no way. And uh, so we put him on an active surveillance protocol. He had periodic MRIs. He had some biopsies over the year. And finally, in 2015, so that was almost 18 years later, if you go down about two thirds of the way, he was uh, diagnosed with a higher grade cancer. So this is what we look for in men on active surveillance. We don't look for the grade six to turn into a, a pussycat into a tiger. What we look for is brand new tigers showing up because men still have a prostate. So that uh, is, you can get a second cancer, just as a woman who had cancer in her left breast can catch it in her, in her right breast. So Bill was diagnosed with an intermediate risk cancer, uh, initially treated with a focal cryotherapy, uh, which was not successful. And then uh, later with a prostate embolization because he had an incredibly large prostate. And then finally in 2020, he had radiation therapy. And at that time, his four plus three had spread uh, into a lymph node outside the prostate. And we've talked about how that's an incredibly serious uh, transition from something that stays in the gland to something that spreads. But, uh, but so far, uh, Mr. Duke has done excellent. The radiation therapy to the lymph node and the prostate has been very successful. His uh, testosterone levels are normal. PSA is undetectable as of November of 2022. So he has had essentially no side effects from the radiation and he is uh, enjoying a good quality of life at uh, he's uh, 80 years old now. So yes, yeah, so he must have been diagnosed when he was 54. So um, 26 year history, uh, but he was able to postpone treatment 18 years. Imagine how much better the treatment was if you're undergoing therapy in uh, say 2015, as opposed to 1997. Yeah, the only option that was of any uh, concern back there was uh, our uh, only option available was, uh, was uh, surgery. So he was able to completely sidestep surgery. And I don't know if this is our last one. I think this is our last case uh, for uh, examples. So this is a, a more interesting uh, case, which I think illustrates the power of PSMA PET scans. Um, this gentleman, um, oh, this is our second to last case. Uh, this uh, gentleman was diagnosed in 2007 uh, with an intermediate three plus four equals seven. And uh, he 
was watched with occasional targeted biopsies in 2009 and 11 and 16, always the same, Gleason 3 plus 3 equals 6. PSA started rising in 2018, all the way up to 18. Uh, he had an MRI targeted biopsy, again, 3 plus 3 equals 6. So the principle is that it can grow in the prostate, but it can't spread. So but PSA has been getting higher and making people more nervous. So in 2020, to confirm that there's nothing spreading outside the prostate, he had a PSMA PET scan, and his PSA at that time was up to 28, making everyone concerned, but thankfully confirmed that there was no uh, spread of any uh, cancer outside the prostate. It did show that the cancer was growing inside the prostate. It doesn't hurt anybody, just so it doesn't spread. Uh, he had another biopsy in 2021, again confirming 3 plus 3, and his PSA, PSMA again in July to confirm no metastasis was repeated last summer, uh, showing no mets, even though his PSA is 31. These high PSA levels make uh, all of us incredibly nervous, but P because PSA historically has been a surrogate for telling you, well, what's the risk of spread? What's the risk of spread? But it's only a projection of risk. It's not a fact. And uh, I've had, through the years, a number of men who've come in that didn't do PSA screening, and their PSA is 75, 80, or 100, and they did not have metastasis. Of course, we never had the courage to watch these men because we didn't have PSMA PET scans back then. But we're seeing uh, now with 3 plus 3, which is not supposed to be able to spread, that it, it has not in this 78-year-old um, over the last 16 years. And then our, our last uh, case, this is a, a, a super unorthodox case that illustrates that even high-grade cancers do not, they don't all spread. So this is a, a, a very uh, a successful contractor here in Los Angeles, uh, diagnosed in 2012 with a PSA of 13. And uh, from the get-go, he had Gleason 4 plus 4 equals 8. This is high-grade prostate cancer. Um, this was checked at Hopkins and confirmed. There's no ambiguity. It was definitely high grade. He had another biopsy in 2016, four years later. Again, four plus four, and by then his PSA is up to 20. So you have to ask yourself, well, why isn't this man being treated? Well, we see clientele of all types and, and stripes and, and types. It's it's a uh, uh, we've uh, vehemently uh, proposed that he should have some sort of radiation treatment to get rid of this tumor that it could spread and become life-threatening. Uh, rather, he has uh, pursued a vegetarian diet and a very stubborn and um, consistent view that it's his body and he can do as he darn well pleases with it, as it, as he pleases with it. So, um, so in continuing to watch this man up to 2019, we could see that the tumor in the prostate was getting quite a bit bigger. I'm going to share a couple of pictures with you and uh, that uh, PSA is getting higher and higher, making us all the more nervous. It's actually hard to talk him into doing a PSMA PET scan, but finally, after about a year of bending his ear, he agreed in January of 2021, and thankfully for his sake, and completely negating all my dire predictions, it showed only disease in the prostate, no metastasis. Starts to make sense if you say, well, gosh, we did that PSMA in 2021. That was nine years after his diagnosis. Should we be expecting metastatic disease? I don't think so. Wouldn't it have already spread? Wouldn't he already be sick? Wouldn't he be having problems if his particular Gleason 8 could spread? And the answer is, well, probably not. It's, we probably shouldn't have been surprised that there were no metastases. So he had another PSMA in March of 2022, continuing to show organ-confined disease. And um, you can see now, as of late, his PSA is up to 52. Makes me nervous, I don't like it, but the principles we're learning as we go about the way prostate cancer behaves, because historically all these people were treated, no one watched them. It takes a unique individual that decides I'm gonna watch something that everyone tells me I shouldn't watch. And you can see that the tumor has definitely grown over the years. This is a image from back in uh, 2016. Um, it's uh, gonna be a little difficult without a pointer, but on the right image you can see on that uh, shadowy blob in the middle. There's a, there's a very dark area. That's the rectum at the bottom of the image on the on the right. And then there's a subtle shadowy area that uh, is demarcated by four little crosses. So that's the limits of the tumor, and the um, uh, the it's about 10 millimeters between the the crosses as they if you go across the center of that shadowy area. And you can see on the left image that there's increased blood flow in that area, de demarcating a, a higher grade tumor. 
doesn't look that impressive. That's uh, uh, 2016. But if you jump ahead six years later to a more recent image, you can see uh, this is the same man. But you can see that the size of this tumor has really, and now it's up to 22 millimeters. You can see it in, again in the lower left-hand side of the, the prostate, which is occupying you know, the center of the, uh, uh, you see all the blood flow there on the lower left-hand side of this high-grade tumor. So a, a high-grade tumor, no doubt, has grown quite a bit over the years. Uh, and the patient himself has seen these images. Uh, he, uh, when we do color Doppler, we always show our patients our images um, and steadfastly refuses to treat this. So with this PSMA PET scan showing no spread, this should be very curable. The uh, question is, and uh, this, uh, how old is he now? I don't know if I put it in here, 77 year old who continues to be sexually active uh, and is unwilling to put his, uh, his sex life at risk. Uh, and can steadfastly uh, is refusing treatment, teaches us all that we have to be careful in drawing uh, firm, uh, you know, unbending conclusions about what the future is going to bring. Uh, this is not the future that I expected for him, but this is what it is. This is the actual human who's done this over the last 10 years and so far uh, has pursued his own beliefs and perhaps done better than pursuing my recommendations. What are the big dangers from doing watching? Everyone thinks it's about cancer spread. I think that cancer spread has, we've got that licked in most ways. We know how to pick the right cancers. We know how to monitor it. That's not the biggest danger. The biggest danger in this modern era is unnecessary treatment. And that is happening at a very high rate in the United States, sadly. Um, there are some other things uh, that uh, when we talk, uh, when we have an opportunity to sit down and talk with people at length about screening for heart disease, screening for other colon cancers, for example, um, uh, for osteoporosis and whatnot. But I think we'll save that for another talk. And uh, at this point, let's do uh, some Q&A and go from there. Been happy to have you as my medical oncologist for almost nine years now, because your practice treats the patient and not the disease. I mean, so many yeah. doctors grab something off the shelf to treat the disease, but as you just pointed out, patients are all different. We come in very many different stripes. Even the tigers are all have different stripes. We're not the same. And one so, of the really cool things about prostate cancer is because things happen over a long period of time, in a sense, we kind of get to know that person's cancer. And, uh, that information is not being used to its greatest advantage. If someone uh, comes in and their you know, cancer spreads after a year or two, we know we're in for a real cat fight. But if, if year after year after year the shoe doesn't drop, we have to draw some conclusions that this particular individual has been blessed with a less malignant variant and we need to slow down and not be so, so uh, enthusiastic about radical treatment in everybody. Right. So um, your focus was generally on those with lower grade disease. Um, and we have many, many watching today and participating today that uh, are in that category. But there are a number like myself with more advanced disease. So we're going to alternate between uh, with questions from uh, people that ask questions on the uh, dashboard, as well as those that submitted questions earlier. We're going to alternate between low grade and more advanced. And some of the more advanced questions I know that I might ask might involve treatment that weren't even mentioned tonight, but you don't necessarily need to explain them. That might take up too much time, but just give us your take on that uh, particular topic. So I'm going to sure. let Howard kick off with one of the low grade questions and we'll go back and forth. Okay. Okay. Great talk, and I think uh, we should include uh, Jim Schrate in this too, because he's he has a little CNS helper helping him monitoring the submitted questions during the program. Uh, but I'll, I'll start off with uh, PSAs and digital rectal exams, and I'm wondering if PSAs should be done without a discussion with patients on their long-term implications. Should a doctor ask consent or just perform them? Well, that's, um, that's a great question because 
the explaining the pros and cons of PSA is uh, is rather time consuming because uh, as we talked about, 30, 40,000 men a year get swept into unnecessary radical treatment, uh, end up impotent and impo uh, impotent and uh, maybe incontinent uh, with the good intentions of screening for cancer, but they got treated for a cancer that didn't really endanger them. So um, the uh, I think there has to be some discussion. Uh, I think that when you get to that level of discussion where people are starting to consider the pros and cons, the patients are probably pretty safe at that juncture. Uh, if it's an intelligent conversation, they know that that they, uh, they should just go rushing into treatment if they find a high PSA. One of the things that spared people a lot is the decision to do an MRI rather than a random biopsy. The uh, the random biopsy happens quick, and and then people are talking about surgery in two weeks. If you if you get an MRI first, find a spot. You have to do some research. You have to find someone that does targeted biopsies. You're getting into a little higher echelon of, of, of medical care. Slows the process down, which is really what's necessary once people get a diagnosis. They need to slow down. And uh, so to answer your question. I, I, you know, I don't do primary care, and I know that many of these primary care doctors are seeing 30, 40 patients a day, and you could easily spend 20 minutes explaining the pros and cons of PSA screening. So practically speaking, what's worse, uh, rushing people into a, uh, a treatment that, uh, or, or a diagnostic tool that could cause harm, or by skipping it altogether? You know, they tried skipping PSA screening altogether between 2012 and 2016, we ended up with a lot of men with unnecessary metastatic prostate cancer. So um, I'd say that uh, uh, I'm a big supporter of doing PSA, but I'm also a big supporter of educating people that uh, many forms of prostate cancer can be safely watched. Should right? digital rectal exams go extinct in active surveillance? Should we rely more on MRIs? Yeah. Um, yes, we still do rectal exams, but it's probably the least important of the monitoring process. If people are getting good quality MRIs, I can I really can't imagine much of a situation where a cancer is going to sneak through uh, where a good MRI is involved. Um, so the, um, uh, the the digital rectal exam, when people have a um, a good quality MRI annually, which is what we recommend in monitoring. Uh, you could argue that the digital rectal exam might be superfluous. You brought up PSMA scans and how this is beginning to change the uh, change the game quite a bit. Uh, some doctors we've noticed are beginning to use a threshold of uh, a PSA of 0 0.2 to go for a PSMA scan, and others still recommend something around 0 0.5 as a threshold. Uh, where do you fall on that? And beyond that, um, will do you think it will be starting to be used for active surveillance eventually, um, or low-grade Gleason 7? Or, and the other part of it is, is it only good for looking for metastasis outside the prostate, or is it good for looking within the prostate for localized disease? So. I'll Three questions. So number one, uh, the last question, you can see the cancer pretty clearly inside the prostate, so it's definitely useful there. Um, for monitoring men that uh, have had uh, previous surgery and their PSA is rising, I believe uh, insurance is starting to pay for it at around 0.2. Um, if you uh, look at the chance of finding something at a PSA at 0.2, it's about 20%. If you look at the chance of finding cancer when the PSA reach, reaches 0.5, it's about 50%. And if it's at, uh, say, uh, up around one, it gets around 80, 90%. But uh, thankfully, Medicare is covering these scans, and I will tend to use them earlier rather than later just because uh, the information is so powerful, and uh, I don't really see much harm in, in running the scan at a lower level. I think I wanna know as soon as possible uh, if it doesn't show anything, that's reassuring, uh, and you have a baseline. Um, what was the second one? That, those were the first and third questions. <laughs> uh, will it be eventually used for active surveillance? Oh, yes. So, uh, well, as you can see, in a sense, we are using it for active surveillance in the examples that I shared with you. The, it's, I don't use it in men with pure 3 plus 3s with PSAs under 10. 
we know that three plus three does not metastasize, and so looking for metastasis seems uh, you know, you're, you've got a higher chance of a false positive than a true positive. But in men that are running higher PSAs, where we're nervous that maybe something is being missed. Uh, the PSMA PET scan is a wonderful way to increase our confidence that we're not missing something. Good. I guess I'll step in again. Um, you know, one of the big concerns amongst um, men on active surveillance is our biopsies. And so I just have two quick hits. Uh, can biopsies spread prostate cancer? Can biopsies cause erectile dysfunction? Yeah, good questions. So we don't think that uh, if, if biopsies are spreading cancer, it's incredibly rare. Uh, a million men undergo biopsies every year and, and prostate cancer has been shown to have a very low met metastatic potential. So we don't, uh, we're more nervous about the possibility of infections. We're worried about the possibility of diagnosing grade three in men that don't, don't wanna know that. And uh, the third one, Possibility of erectile dysfunction? Yes, uh, with random biopsies, we have seen occasional men who've developed serious and lasting erectile dysfunction after random biopsy, sadly. Um, doesn't happen too commonly, but it's sure a tragedy when it happens in this otherwise healthy people. Jim, you're following up on that. Um, since advanced and aggressive prostate cancer be can be su become such a game changer for men, in regards to their sexual identity and function, why don't physicians push their patients toward counseling and psychiatric care or warn them more of the oncoming functional changes uh, much more thoroughly? Well, I think um, I'll give you an example of, of what I think is going on. I think when, when, you're, when you're running a big business, urologists are the third highest paid doctors in the country after plastic surgeons and cardiologists. Um, you don't want to create barriers to people doing surgery. I, in my opinion, if someone's going to have surgery, they need to be informed prior to the surgery that we're going to give injections in your penis after the operation until you recover spontaneous erections. Because we know from studies that you have a much better chance for recovery if you'll take injections in your penis right after the operation and continue it until the, the, uh, the loss of uh, potency is until you've recovered. And, no one ever tells patients that. My God, would anyone do surgery if you told them, look, we're going to stick needles in your penis until you get your erections back? It only may take six to 24 months before you get your erections back. But uh, when I see patients after surgery, they're never informed about that. And I think it's all because they, um, the surgeons realize how tenuous it is to get someone into the OR when the radiation therapists have a better treatment with far less toxicity. So they know that they got to get them in that OR within the first few weeks after diagnosis or they're never coming to the operating room. So, um, so I think it's the pressure as a business and I think it's, it's terrible. Um, I don't know that I've expressed it as vividly as I could, but it is, it's, a, it's a real tragedy that uh, people are not being uh, educated properly about their options before irreversible decisions are made. Um. There, there have been uh, questions in the chat as well as submitted questions having to do with diet. And I don't know if it's really the same question for low risk versus high risk uh, patients. But, you know, it's up to you to decide how to address it. But are there certain diets such as plant-based diets or Mediterranean diets that, that are effective for high risk and low risk? And how, you know, how important is heart healthy? If we have a healthy heart, does our prostate follow? And thirdly, and it's all related, is what about supplements? People always want to know about supplements. So I turn it over to you, doctor. All right. Obviously, we could do a whole talk on those things. But bottom line is that in men with serious cancer, serious prostate cancers, remember that in this modern era, that's only a minority of the men that have prostate cancer have serious prostate cancers. In the old days, we were able to show, and others uh, demonstrated, that vegetarian diets could slow the rate of PSA rise or even stop rising PSA in men with uh, cancer coming back after surgery with vegetarian diets. So there's really no ambiguity that vegetarian diets inhibit prostate cancer. However, most men don't have serious cancers. They have rather mild cancers, and we don't, um, 
try and uh, change their whole lifestyle because we don't think their prostate cancer is going to define their long-term outcome. Their cardiovascular world is going to define their future. And good diets that uh, prevent atherosclerosis are incredibly important. So, um, so vegetarian diets are efficacious, but they're not easy to implement. And uh, so I don't push them hard on men on active surveillance because I think they're gonna do well anyway. But uh, the other question you had was about the um, uh, supplements. And the supplements, um, uh, again, probably doesn't make much difference in the men with low grade cancers that we have on active surveillance. But in men that have uh, more serious cancers, we think it's deleterious to take multivitamins because your body will do quite well without a multivitamin, but many cancers don't grow very well unless you feed them lots of vitamins and nutrients and minerals. So don't feed your advanced cancer with vitamins and nutrients and minerals. It'll simply grow more quickly and spread further. Uh, so I think that you want to avoid multivitamins in men with serious cancers. You know, let me quickly throw in to exercise. How important is exercise for low risk and high risk men? So we, the end of my talk that we cut short was all about fitness and uh, the uh, impact of fitness on longevity. So for people in our age group, 60s, 70s and 80s, there's probably nothing you can do that will have a bigger impact on both your longevity, your quality of life, your mood and your memory than fitness. So if uh, someone has uh, financial means and they don't have a trainer to, to work them out three days a week, they're wasting their money on the wrong things. Uh, it's, the trainers are expensive, but I'll tell you, it's money well spent. That's how I feel about exercise. Oh, Peter. I agree. I, went, I started going to a trainer about three months ago because I found I was pushing myself too hard and injuring myself without uh, a trainer. I, I go outside the trainer, but at least I have his uh, I, I, his standards to go by. I know what my yep. limitations are now. Mm -hmm. um, within the last couple of years, we've had the advent of nuclear medicine now. It used to be you just needed a, uh, with advanced disease, you, need, you saw a urologist, you saw a radiation oncologist or, and a medical oncologist. Now we've got uh, nuclear, uh, doctors. So um, Plavicto is one of the um, treatments that's gained some uh, traction recently. Mm -hmm. um, and like many uh, treatments for advanced disease, sometimes you don't get, um, we're not talking cure, we're talking usually um, holding things back or holding things at bay for a while. What's your experience uh, so far with Plavicto? Uh, after a man completes six cycles, uh, in general, how long is it before their PSA starts rising again? And can Plavicto be used again for another cycle? So um, I would I would say that it, when Plavicto is stopped, that it's not uncommon for PSA to start rising fairly quickly. Not, there's no all or, or none in this world. Um, but I think if you want to put Plavicto in context, two things. One is right now it's only FDA approved for someone that's already had chemotherapy. And uh, that's not very many men with prostate cancer these days have had chemotherapy. Chemotherapy has been sort of a last ditch type thing. So we're talking about people in really serious straits. At first they've had to have at least some chemotherapy. And now we're giving them another medicine, assuming maybe the chemotherapy stopped working or maybe it didn't, but it's certainly a serious world. And, uh, and what we, the studies seem to show is about a third of men that take Plavicto that are in that category of people will have dramatic, wonderful responses with tremendous regression of their cancer. These are and what we would otherwise historically have considered hopeless cases. Another third will develop disease stabilization where the PSA has been going up and the scans are getting worse and that ceases, that they stabilize. And then another third of men, it doesn't seem to work that good. So. It's not a miracle drug, but we're extremely glad that we have it in our, our quiver now. And uh, it's well tolerated. It causes a little bit of dry mouth, sometimes a little drop in blood counts. So I would say in general, better tolerated than chemo, you know, chemotherapy for prostate cancer isn't that bad, but it's still chemotherapy. And there are uh, there's a push right now to get Plavicto FDA approved to uh, for administration prior to chemotherapy. And that'll probably be along in the next year or two. So, uh, and I think it'll be popular in that setting. Everyone always wants to push chemo to the very last uh, before they, uh, everything else is run out, so to speak. 
So it's very exciting that we have it. It is not a universal miracle drug, but it is um, uh, in some people, so let's say a third of the people that take it, it's almost like a miracle drug. Great. Yep. I'm going to riff on something that came out of the chat. Uh, so somebody was, well, okay, we have active surveillance, uh, which is a lot of monitoring. We have uh, watchful waiting, which you don't hear too much about anymore, which they used to say was uh, too much waiting, not enough watching. Uh, <laughs> what, what happens when you get older? I'm, I'm 75, and my doctor pretty much has given up on, uh, you know, any more MRIs, any more uh, biopsies. And so I get followed once a year with a phi test. I, I call this passive aggressive surveillance because <laughs> it's a little bit of both. But somebody asked a question kind of along those lines, and, and it's twofold. One is, when do you leave active surveillance? And are, are you ever too old for active surveillance? You know, a lot of these guys are in their 80s and 90s, and they're very confused about which way to go. You know, I hear, I talked to an 85-year-old guy, I said, I want to stay on it till I'm in my 90s and talk to an 82-year-old guy who said, you know, it's served me well, but maybe my time is up. So at any rate, a couple of questions there. Yeah, very good question. Uh, statistically, the majority of people in their 80s that have been on active surveillance for a while, you say, let's say they live to be 94 and they'll die with and not of their cancers. The, um, there is a small minority where pr prostate cancers can behave more aggressively. I think the um, uh, the reason that many men sort of stay on a protocol of monitoring is it isn't that big a deal. You get a PSA twice a year and you get a uh, scan once a year. Uh, and it also, uh, you know, in many cases, we're acting sort of like primary care physicians for these people. We're making sure that their cholesterol is okay and their diet and their exercise, all the things that uh, it's good to be held accountable about health in general. So uh, if the... Um, uh, you know, I contend that you don't have to see a prostate oncologist to do active surveillance. You can get an MRI once a year at a reputable center and do PSA testing twice a year. And in most cases, that will be sufficient. So everyone should, I believe, especially as we get older, should be seeing a family doctor once or twice a year, uh, maybe a cardiologist once or twice a year. This is, uh, uh, you know, I think, that, again, the second half of my talk, which I cut short because things were running a little bit long, is really about in the context of prostate cancer, it's other things that end up killing us. So let's take a few precautions against those other things. Let's not just say, okay, I'm not going to die of prostate cancer. My health care concerns are now gone. No, 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 no. They, we become much more fragile and we have a accumulation of health-related issues as we get older. Your average oncologist like myself is also board certified in internal medicine and, uh, and we know how to manage blood pressure and cholesterol and all these other things that still uh, remain relevant as people get older. I'm going to ask a question that uh, is close to my heart. Uh, not everybody lucks out like I did and finds their way to a, uh, a genital urinary medical oncologist right off the bat, right after diagnosis. And uh, I'm very thankful for that. But what about most, most men, you know, end up with the urologist off the bat and stick with them for a while, maybe too long. Um, should germline genetic testing be a standard of care that urologists insist on, at least germline testing? And when would you recommend uh, further testing? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So um, what we're talking with germline basically is to look and see if in your family tree, is there are there predispositions to certain illnesses that can be detected with a mouth swab or a blood test? And I don't routinely do um, genetic testing in everybody in my practice. The um, the yield is low. Um, you'll, you'll find uh, now and then you'll find something. And some people say with active surveillance, you know, the BRCA mutations occur in, you know, five to eight percent of people that you should test everybody. And that that changes everything. It doesn't change everything for me. I still think if you watch people closely, BRCA or not, you can still do active surveillance. So um, it's kind of that discussion we had with the PSA testing earlier. The uh, It takes a lot of time to go through say, well, you're, there's a very small yield that you're going to find something actionable, and there's a higher possibility you'll find out some bad news that you can do nothing about. 
and there's an even higher possibility that it's a waste of time. So, um, so I don't routinely do uh, germline testing in all my patients. Uh, if any patients want it or request it, I'm happy to order it for them. But I'm, it's not something that I have found to be um, all that useful. It, it, there's only so much time in the meetings that we have, and usually we have some really uh, important things to cover in the amount of time allotted for our meetings, and it doesn't come up that often. I would guess that in my whole practice that maybe one to two percent of the men have had germline testing. You know, this is one of the places you, where support group come in handy. Yes, uh, it's something where you want to know what you're doing before you jump into it. You um, you really want to do your homework and decide if you really want that information or not. It's easy to get. Medicare covers it. Uh, so it's not like there's any cost barriers to getting it if you're interested. Now, can you clarify what germline testing is, actually? I mean, there's two kinds of DNA testing. Uh, they test our own inheritance, and they test the uh, DNA in our cancers. So can you clarify some of the terminology for that? Yeah. Well, so DNA in our cancers is somatic testing. Germline is testing our bodies to see if we're predisposed to cancers. Now we do almost routine somatic testing uh, that is looking at the DNA of the cancer uh, in people with any type of uh, advanced cancer, uh, because sometimes we'll find out uh, new treatments that we can use, uh, it gives us prognosis, and there's also ways to use that, those genetic abnormalities floating around in the blood, like another surrogate PSA, in other words, a tumor marker. They, they, get, they go up when the cancer's growing and they go back and they drop when the cancer's in, uh, going into remission. So, so, uh, so somatic uh, testing with Garden 360 or Foundation One is uh, routine for advanced prostate cancers to help understand the cancer better, ho hopefully find new treatments, and also offers ways to monitor how successful your treatment is. You know, if I can toss in another question about genetics, genomics, uh, we we had a. Uh, guy come into a support group. This is not a joke. It's not a not leading into a punchline. Uh, uh, so this guy comes in and he said his PSA looked good, his Gleason score looked good. He was low risk. But then he took a particular test, decipher test, and his his new year, well, he, he saw a couple of uh, urologists at major institutions and they wanted to rush him into surgery just based on this single test. And then he, he got like a third opinion from another, another doctor, another major institution, who said, you know, you should have never had that decipher test to begin with because you were low risk. So what, what's your advice on that? I'm, I'm, you know, if I'd had more time, I would have included some of this discussion in my talk. It's very important. So the... Um, Historically, and even to this day, we base our uh, decision about doing active surveillance based on the genetics of the Gleason score. So we're looking at the tumor cells under the uh, microscope and we can, we can guess what the genetics, just by looking at you, I can guess at your genetics. You look like you're a bunch of uh, forebears from Western Europe or maybe Eastern Europe. Um, so genetics show outside and that's what Gleason score is doing. It's showing visibly what kind of a cancer cell it is. So that's been the mainstay of deciding who we can watch and who we can't watch. So wouldn't it be nice if we had a way we could go right in and measure the genes themselves? And there's three products on the market, Prolaris, Oncotype, and Decipher. And they look at those genes and they've looked at large databases and said, okay, people with this gene pattern, they have metastasis or they die. And these people with these gene pattern, they don't have metastasis and they don't die. So sounds fantastic. The problem is that the, um, they're not perfect. They're just a statistical projection, number one. Number two, they're based on databases that weren't done in active surveillance. They were done in people that had surgery or radiation and they looked at what happened later. Uh, so these are much sicker people than the average guy going on active surveillance. These are people that needed treatment. Uh, so they don't really compare very well with the active surveillance groups. Uh, and then number three, the, um, uh, we already proved that active surveillance is safe in Gleason 3 plus 4 and uh, 3 plus 3s and some 3 plus 4s a long time ago. Why are we looking the golden goose and asking, well, let's look for trouble. Let's, let's do a genetic test that we know is not perfect and uh, may, may incorrectly state that the future is very bleak. So I don't do, I agree, I don't do genetic tests in 3 plus 3. I do genetic tests uh, for, uh, as a tiebreaker in people that I'm 
on the fence. You know, this is a three plus four. Should we watch it? Should we treat it? All right, let's get a genetic test to try and push us one way or another. It's not a perfect answer, but it's some new information. Uh, could be useful. I only use Polaris and Oncotype in the times where you're on the fence and you can't decide. Usually the three plus fours, uh, don't do it in the three plus threes. Good. Before I turn it over to Ben, I'd like to sneak in a follow-up here with germline testing because we have run into guys who look like they're perfect Gleason sixes. and uh, But it turns out dad has a, a BRCA defect, sister has a BRCA defect, and uh, he ends up uh, having, you know, the, you know, a radical prostatectomy, and they find like a, like a Gleason 9 hidden away. So, I mean, in those kind of circumstances, what, you know, do, do you not recommend uh, uh, germline testing? Or do you? Uh, well, so, so, well, sounds this person already. Oh, this person already had uh, somatic testing uh, based on their cancer. And the question is, should they have germline to find out if the BRCA came from them or did it come from the cancer? Yeah, I think that's reasonable. I mean, BRCA is the one um, the one mutation that uh, is common. We know that it has a somewhat worse prognosis. Number two and number three, we know that there's a, actually a medicine that treats it effectively called olaparib. Uh, there's a couple of medicines, uh, Rucapareb as well. So yeah, it's very useful to know about BRCA. The trouble is that it's not so common that I want to just test everybody, uh, especially in the early active surveillance, which is kind of the context of our talk tonight. In uh, in more advanced prostate cancers, we do uh, genetic testing in everybody, and we certainly would agree with doing it in someone whose uh, who's somatic you know, uh, testing showed BRCA. I, I would definitely get germline. So maybe, we, you know, we we had a little bit of technical problems. Ben is uh, is the backup pitcher. He's going to come in. Maybe he can ask a couple of extra questions from uh, the chat room. So Ben, why don't you? Uh, this is his debut. So it's nice to meet you, Dr. Schultz. One of the um, one of the members of the audience asked whether the risk picture changes for African Americans. Is a is a Gleason six the same if you're black? Well, at least in six, definitely. But um, the, um, uh, you know, there's, it's, it, I would say that African American men um, are at a little bit higher risk of somewhat worse outcomes, but nothing so radical that I would change my, my uh, just because of this, someone's skin color. Um, I would still treat them, uh, anyone who's eligible for active surveillance, who's another race, I would treat the African-American people exactly the same. Ben, why don't you throw another one in from the uh, gallery? Uh, another person asked, how do you, <laughs> how do you know that your, question, that your doctor is up to date? How do you know that your doctor is not out of date in terms of the treatment that you're getting? Oh, I think that that's pretty easy. Uh, the um, patient after patient after patient has come to me through the years saying, I got a little concerned when I realized I know more about prostate cancer than my doctor. So if, if, a, if someone is doing very little study on their own and has made very little effort to understand prostate cancer, you're not gonna be able to tell. But if you study, it, it doesn't take long for you to actually know more than your doctor. The average urologist is treating hundreds of different diseases and he's extremely busy cutting out body parts all day long. He doesn't have time to study. So, so if you just devote yourself for even a brief period of time educating yourself, you will surpass the knowledge of your urologist very quickly. So what is a good way to educate yourself? Because there's, there's more than enough information and misinformation than anyone can get their, their mind around. Well, that's two, basically two different problems. Uh, first, people have... I think you learn how to smell out, sniff out crud by applying yourself to trying to learn. Uh, once you uh, apply yourself to try to get to the bottom of things, then you develop the skills of, of you know, getting the wheat from the chaff. You, you, you start to see the, the, the posers and the people who, you know, it's, uh, I think it's just a matter of digging in. Um, the, um, Dr. Moyad has a book out that um, 
actually goes through the, the scientific process that is uh, appropriate. Which book is that, Alex? Um, it says it his, uh, I think it's his book on supplements. Yeah, there's a couple chapters in there on how you uh, tell the difference between a good scientific study and a, and a crappy scientific study. And if people will uh, go back to the original studies and look at the studies that are well performed by reputable people, that's where you find truth. Um, if you just want to accept any study that was done in lab rats, um, you're going to be lost forever. So you have to um, you have to apply yourself to learning, of course, and then you have to be selective in terms of the type of science uh, that you that you pursue studying uh, based on the quality of the studies. Randomized prospective trials done in humans uh, are the ones that are most relevant to us, and uh, and so. If people will uh, go back to the source documents, uh, it's it's an arduous process, but the more you do it, the quicker it comes. So, so what's a good way to prep um, in terms of your knowledge before your urologist visit, so that you do know at least as much as, or or that you you don't end up knowing. I'm sorry, that you know enough. What's the best? Well, I mean, first off, you know, yeah. I, one of the most important things I think for newly diagnosed people is to um, is to find a way to uh, overcome the tremendous anxiety. It's very hard to learn when people are frightened, and um, so first and foremost, I think people have to realize that the prostate world, thank God, happens. Things happen very slowly, and there is time to learn. Uh, a lot of people, I think, are unwilling to put in the time and effort to learn. Uh, but for those of you who are, don't feel rushed by the process. Take your time and you know, learn the vocabulary, learn the, um, you know, uh, what the main treatments are, what the main side effects are, and uh, and I think that the, uh, I mean, we see patients do it all the time. I mean, I have uh, well-informed patients coming to see me all day long, and uh, that it's not, it's not. Uh, it's not an insurmountable mountain. I think it's just a matter of people willing to take time um, and not be frightened into jumping before they understand what they're doing. Yeah, Peter, we must be, we must be getting close to the end. Uh, you want to use this segue to just mention your, uh, I mean, you are a very unique physician to have a nonprofit arm that's dedicated to educating your patients and, and others. Uh, do you want to take a moment to just mention your upcoming uh, live mid mid year conference and what Thank you, you do? Thank you. Yes, very much. So we're finally uh, you know, we've been doing uh, online conferences and that will continue. But would you feel comfortable coming and talking about that, Alex? Uh, so Alex is the um, CEO of uh, the Prostate Cancer Research Institute that puts on these conferences. It's very kind of you to allow us to take a moment. I'm going to have Alex tell you about. Finally, an in-person conference we're doing again after two years of crazy COVID stuff. And uh, Alex, why don't you come on up and, and tell him? I'm not as tall as him, so I'm going to stand back a little bit. <laughs> so on March 11th, we are coming back in person. We're very excited. We've been virtual since 2019, which in the meantime, our YouTube channel has grown. So if you guys want to actually get educated on prostate cancer and see more of Dr. Schultz, you can visit our YouTube channel. Uh, if you type in the PCRI on YouTube, you'll see that. But on March 11th, we're going to be covering advanced prostate cancer treatments, proton therapy, and um, also prostate imaging. And so we have some of the leading experts coming in to do that. We're going to have Dr. Scholes and Dr. Moya doing extended Q&A. And then on the 11th, it's going to be the in-person. So it's going to be at the LAX Marriott. You can fly into LAX, take a shuttle. Everything's going to be in one place. And then two weeks later, if you are not able to come in person, we're going to be broadcasting it live virtually. And so that'll be on March 25th. And if you guys have any questions, you can visit PCRI.org. Uh, if you guys need help with your personal cases, I know we had a lot of specific prostate cancer questions. You can contact the PCRI helpline again at PCRI.org. And thanks for having us. It was exciting. So I, I have a question for Dr. Schultz, if he hasn't run out the room yet. Are you still with us, Dr. Schultz? Of course, yes. What, what can I help? How can I help you? So, last a couple of weeks ago, I saw the new ACS numbers for prostate cancer, and you may have seen them too. And um, 
what bothered me intensely is that the estimates for 2023 are very significant, 288,000 estimated. And if we look at what's happened since 2019, what we're seeing is um, an average 16% increase. If you just do a straight line average and you don't get fancy. Now, Prostate cancer increasing at 16% a year over the last four or five years is scary. That's epidemic. Um, how are we going to deal with this? What should we be doing? And, and why the heck is ACS talking about 3% per year between 2014 to 2019 when they're estimating it increasing at 16% per year? Well, the same thing happened when we first brought PSA testing out, is that uh, when you don't screen for PSA testing, which is what happened in the United States between 2012 and 2016, uh, you just push it into the future. So right now we're in the future, and we're picking up all those people that weren't diagnosed back in 2012 to 2016. It'll settle down again, probably back to around 200,000 a year, and of whom 100,000 will have harmless cancers and 100,000 will have uh cancers that we can cure or need to be cured right right no i i i agree with you um back in 2012 there were folks like you and me and, and others that were telling the acs and the uspstf that watch out for 10 years from now and i yep. think we're seeing the results and i think one of the things that scares us is that those death figures are going to move up incredibly yep. um I mean, I don't know in your practice, but certainly in our support groups, we're seeing a very, very significant increase in de novo metastatic diagnoses. Yep. Um, and it's it's a huge concern. You know, I'm just wondering how we're going to handle all these men. It's heartbreaking. Well, our tools for handling it is, are much better than they've ever been. Uh, but it is sad that these were preventable problems. They were uh, preventable problems that uh, we had an excellent tool for and we just weren't using it. Thank God they recanted and in 2016 they they went, oops, we screwed up. And uh, But unfortunately a lot of the industry, uh, the primary care doctors are still, you know, because of that four-year hiatus, they're still less than convinced that they should be doing PSA testing. So um, it's, it's, I mean, PSA was such a revolutionary, uh, incredible discovery. And right. uh, when when you just decide to to uh, forego usage of such a powerful tool, there inevitably there'll be repercussions. But I think that uh, you know there there are even better technologies coming in the future. There will be a day someday where we have something even better than PSA. And uh, a lot of times technology ends up saving us from our own foolishness. So we'll uh, we'll see how it turns out. But I, we do have the resources to handle this, and uh, and I think. People have wised up, and PSA testing is getting back to normal. Uh, yeah, we're going to have to reap the whirlwind here for a little while for the uh, bad behavior between 2012 and 2016. Thank you. Th thank you for, for that opinion. Um, and thank you for a wonderful presentation, for your patience in answering a lot of questions. There are a lot more questions that didn't get answered, and, and, and I'm hoping that some of those will, uh, will get answered um, with us working closely with PCRI. So um, watch this space, those of you who are still on the webinar, and we'll try and help you. Um, I do encourage you all to attend PCRI, uh, both the midsummer and, 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 and hopefully in September. Um, and um, I also encourage you to attend our support groups. Whilst we don't give medical advice, we have incredible peer resources people who are have learned so much from handling that their own situations people like peter kafka who is the lead moderator for our low intermediate group and one of our moderators for our um, high-risk recurrent advanced group uh, we have an active surveillance group where we just talk about active surveillance if anybody wants to talk about more than active surveillance we throw them out and we move them up to a higher group.
because um, one of the things that I have gotten to learn um, under the tutelage of, of Howard Walensky is that active surveillance is a situ early active surveillance, I should say. I'm talking about active surveillance with low risk disease when you're first diagnosed um, is a beast unto itself. And men following active surveillance need some, some very special consideration and that's what we try to do. So um, just want to thank everybody. A, a quick word to, um, to thank our sponsors um, who sponsor our virtual support groups, Bayer, Pfizer, uh, Mayavant, Janssen, and Myriad. And with that, um, thank you again to PCRI, to Dr. Schultz, especially to Alex. And uh, we will say good night. There will be a recording. It will show up within a couple of days. Good night, everybody.